Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're joining from. Welcome to the ABC's Economic Update, the future of energy in Nigeria and its impact on the economy. So my name is Joseph Ishii, I'm from the American Business Council, and uh, I will just briefly go through the housekeeping rules. Uh, automatically, your mics have been uh, muted as you log in, and only the panelists can have your video on. Uh, you can send in your questions during the Q&A, and when sending your questions, please identify yourself and your organization. Uh, if you want to speak, kindly raise your hands. The relevant materials and resources will be made available to everyone after the webinar. So I would want to call on Ms. Olele, the CEO of the Council, to give the welcome remarks. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining this meeting. And on behalf of the American Business Council, I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, e event uh, where we are going to be discussing the future of energy in Nigeria and its impact on the economy. As we all are aware, uh, the Industry Act has been passed into law. And for us, this is the, one of the most audacious um, that the government has ever really done an attempt to overall uh, the petroleum uh, industry sector in Nigeria. So we're going to be looking at this um, act uh, in in light of you know uh, the global call for the transition of clean to clean energy, uh, the remarkable renewable energy transitions, and the carbon uh, border adjustments. Um, well, we will also discuss um, and highlight the incentives for further investments into Nigeria's um, oil and gas sector and how Nigeria should adjust towards the global energy demands, especially gas. So uh, again, once more, I would like to thank everyone for joining in and I'll hand over to Chijoke Wabuete, our partner at PwC, who would moderate the discussion uh, with our invited speakers today. Thank you, everyone. Hey, um... Thank you, uh, thank you, Margaret, and um, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I think this, for me, this session is one of many sessions that have happened around the PIA um, over the past uh, month or so since the um, bill was signed into law. And, um, I think some of the things we're looking to kind of look um, discuss today are key issues you know, that I think will be extremely interesting for those who are listening, you know, looking at things like the, the impact of the PIA on various sectors of the economy. Obviously, Nigeria's energy future and energy transition, I will be looking at other opportunities and incentives for investing. Um, what I'll do, um, we've decided we've adopted a panel um, discussion type format for this uh, interaction. So I'll just uh, move on to a um, quick introduction of the panelists. So um, the first panelist is uh, Mr. Hamilton AC, who is the General Manager of Corporate Communications at LECO. Um, he's responsible for LECO's corporate and internal communication, public relations and partner relations and government affairs. He also leads, develops, and executes the company's strategic information and technology initiatives. Um, He's also had prior experience on, as an architect in North leading projects in the United States. Um, so Hamilton comes, uh, Mr. Hamilton is he comes with a lot of experience and um, I, I look forward to interacting with him. Um, next is uh, Isiria Bay, who is a partner in PwC. Um, she leads uh, the PwC People Loop organization tax team and the private wealth client services. Um, she also leads the international tax services practice in PwC Nigeria, having worked with PwC New York in advising clients on optimal international tax structures across Africa. Um, she has a lot of experience across different industries, um, 
energy, consumer industries, technology, media and entertainment. Um, and Siri is actually part of the PwC oil and gas and energy team. And uh, she also comes with a lot of experience, both in, from the practical standpoint of engaging clients in the industry and what she's also garnered from her international experience working in New York. Next, please. And then uh, next is uh, David, uh, Mr. David Williams. He's the co-founder of Decarbon Africa. Um, he's accelerated energy businesses around the world with finance by connecting private capital and environmental technology for nearly 20 years. And he serves as a Sir Edmund Hillary Fellow recognized for mission-driven finance, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and is also a special advisor with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory for International Climate Finance. You know, he's worked with UK Nigeria Infrastructure Advisory Facility and has also had a long history in innovation, including recognition as one of Time Magazine's Innovators of the Year. Um, he co-founded Energy Peace Partners, a non-profit and Developed a novel environment attribute that successfully provided finance to solar projects in climate vulnerable conflict regions in Africa. So, if you look at the the aspect really where we're talking about um, the future of energy, I think David is very well placed to you know give us a really good um, you know feedback on that. And the next panelist is Tengi George Ikoli who is an energy and extractive governance consultant. Um, Tengi is a lawyer, economist, and she has uh, over seven years uh, of experience, including her most recent role at the program coordinator of the Nigerian Natural Resource Charter, NNRC. Um, she has a joint honors degree in law and economics from the University of Wales and master's from the University of Bristol. She's also been, you know, actively involved in development of the of legislation around uh, petroleum resources in Nigeria, especially um, the Petroleum Industry Bill, which is now the Petroleum Industry Act. Uh, she comes with a lot of experience, both from a policy standpoint and um, also practical experience in uh, engaging with the industry. And I really look forward to hearing Tenki's thoughts around, you know, the timing of the PIA. So that's pretty much our panels uh, introduced. So I'm going to jump quickly into the Q&A session because we're looking at the future of energy in Nigeria and its impact on the Nigerian economy. So I'm going to actually, because Tengi is the last person I kind of introduced, I'd like to actually jump into um, jump in with Tengi to ask Tengi that the timing of the PIA, you know, Looking at you know the current um, you know focus on energy transition, do you think this is the right time for the PIA? And do you think that the PIA is um, a piece of legislation that is relevant for the world we live in now? Um, I mean, the first, the best time to have passed the PIA, um, as I said, has been twenty years ago when it was first um, thought of. Uh, 10 years would have been even better, five maybe. Um, now it's a bit late in the game, um, but I mean, it's passed and Nigeria still has its um, its reserves in oil and gas, which are quite huge. And it still depends on, on oil for um, about 50% of the government urban revenues um, for its exports, et cetera. So Nigeria still needs, needs the resource. Um, it's, it's a little late in the game, obviously, because you have um, the climate change um, awareness growing. Um, you have commitments being made by um, even Nigeria's top five exporters um, around going, moving away from away from fossil fuel, going to carbon neutrality. You have China, India, um, who Nigeria relies on for exports, um, moving away from this. So it's, it's quite late in the game. Um, but we have at least, um, we can take advantage of the opportunities now that still exist. We know it's closing and closing rapidly. Um, but we do have some time because Nigeria doesn't have an option really um, to try to get what it can out of its oil and gas um, resources. We can't hear you. 
Sorry, I had to apologize. So kind of picking up on that, right? Um, now, you know, you, you are a lawyer and um, obviously you you also spent some time looking at the act. And I'm just wondering that, you know, looking at the PIA, um, what's your view on the governance and institutions chapter of the PIA at the two-tier regulatory approach adopted? Okay, um, yes, yeah, so with the, the governance um, component, uh, I mean, initially, because uh, we're a part of civil society organizations um, and advocates that initially proposed a single regulator, um, it would have been neater. Uh, one of the issues that had been complained about was around ease of doing business um, by companies. And so the better, um, I guess, at the time would have been that single regulator, um, but we have this dual regulator now, which also is not is not um, it's, it's still fair as long as there are some integrations and collaborations within within the commission, um, which is mandated to regulate the upstream sector and then the authority, which is mandated to regulate the midstream and the downstream sector. So where there's kind of collaboration in that regard, um, that would certainly be, ne be needed. Um, and be useful to ensure that the same problems or the same challenges that had been faced prior to the PIA um, are not again um, faced. Uh, but in terms of the governance framework, there's a lot of clarity as well in terms of governance. That was that was a bit of a challenge um, prior to the passage of the PIA. So you had a bit of the modeling of the commercial and the regulatory roles, um, specifically within um, NNPC. Um, you had a quasi uh, regulator in the form of DPR, whose um, roles and powers were ceded by the minister um, as a result of the previous act. But now you have a very structured um, governance framework, which provides clarity in terms of the role of the minister, which is to formulate and monitor and administer, administer um, policy. Um, and give policy directives. And then you have the regulators, the dual regulators, which you have the upstream, um, upstream commission, and then you have the authority um, for the midstream and the downstream. And then you have the NOC, the NNPC, which will then be focused squarely on commercial, its commercial role, um, being more profit oriented, which is certainly needed, um, that clarity in terms of operating now, given the context that I initially stated with um, the imperatives to quickly optimize uh, the revenues and benefits that can be gotten from the oil and gas um, reserves um, now while we still have um, some time. Um, and saying that, though, it does appear that obviously it's a difficult time, but you have um, the UK, you know, having its issues around energy. You have um, some component of the US as well, where Biden had requested for um, OPEC to have some uh, leniency around that. So you have you have the, the whole, um, the globe really trying to figure out how to transition effectively. So there is that, that's still a that small window. So it's a good thing, I suppose, that we passed the bill, um, the PIB, that when, when we did. Thank you, Tengi. And um, we just have, um, you know, the... Africa tax leader for PwC who has just joined the, the Taiwan Yedele, and he's also the fiscal policy leader. And you know, Taiwo, I'm going to ask you a fiscal policy question. Um, can you please provide insights on how the government intends to utilize the PIA as a fiscal tool for economic growth and development? In your thoughts. Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Joke, and, and thanks to David for inviting me to join this panel. Um, so I think maybe next only to governance and transparency, I would say the primary reason for the PIA is actually the government take. So government wants more money, government needs more money. But the point also is that investment is dwindling in the sector, essentially driven by the uncertainties around policy environment, around regulation, around governance, administration, and so many other things. And also because the world is, you know, beginning to move away from, from fossil fuel, especially in terms of investment. So the question then is, how do you make more money? 
when investment is moving in a different direction and how do you also make more money when you want to make the sector uh, commercially uh, attractive to investors so it's a tough balance uh, so what i think government has done uh, is to try and see how do we drive efficiency so we can make more money without the uh, investors losing money because it's not a zero-sum game so you see the PIA was very intentional in trying to drive efficiency. Some of it is introducing the uh, cost uh, revenue ratio. Uh, so to so say, you know what, do whatever you can to bring down your cost. Another thing is, you know, moving away from what we used to call petroleum investment allowance, which, which was giving you an allowance for spending money on CapEx, to production allowance, which is you now get this allowance for producing. So, uh, and those are just a few examples. So the other ones is bringing down the headline rate uh, from as high as 85% before to the highest of 60%. We combine hydrocarbon uh, plus CIT and you maybe are in uh, you know, shallow waters. Um, so for example, uh, you know, even though the, the headline rate is lower, government may end up you know, making more money uh, because the deductions are, are now very different. And then overall, I think the biggest impact from a fiscal uh, perspective is once you grow the size of the pie, even a small bite will give you a bigger chunk than if the pie was small and you were hoping to just bite everything away. Uh, so you get to a point where nobody will be, will be investing. And the other dimension to the fact that, you know, apart from government take and the fiscal side is that if you get the fiscal side right, it would also have a big impact on the monetary side as well as the whole economy, whole of the economy. Uh, so today, why Nigeria is struggling with the exchange rate of naira to the dollar is because we just don't have enough uh, enough dollars around. If we are producing somewhere around three to four million barrels per day, and the price is somewhere close to you know eighty dollars per barrel, naira would not be you know five hundred and something or whatever it is in the different markets and windows. And the reason why we can't produce 3 million or 4 million barriers is one, the ratio of our reserve to production is controlled by OPEC. And number two, we haven't invested enough to be able to ramp up production, even when we have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, thanks, Taiwo. But I just still stay on the impact of the PIA because, you know, it seems to me that, you know, we keep talking about the impact on um, oil and gas companies, but what other sectors of the Nigerian economy can we expect to be impacted by the PIA? And you know, what are your thoughts around sectors as well? Yeah, great question, uh, Chidioke. So I think you know many business leaders uh, unfortunately think that this conversation about PIA is about oil and gas, uh, and maybe some refining and downstream. <laughs> so we actually did a study uh, when we we're having a session with business leaders, and one of the questions we asked them was how impactful do you think this will be on your business? And then there was a scale of zero to five. And there were people who thought it would be zero impact on them. So I think the, the truth and the reality is that every single sector will be impacted. Of course, some more than the other. So oil and gas sector will be more impacted than say, for example, uh, manufacturing. But everyone will be impacted, uh, including SMEs and the informal sector. And this impact, you know, some that are more, you know, obvious would be like financial services. I mean, other than oil and gas, financial services, fund managers, uh, there will be a lot of activities around M&A. Uh, there will be things around, uh, you know, even the fact that the sector will be at some point deregulated. So you have a commercially uh, focused, profit-oriented NNPC, and then you have the, you know, midstream refining and gas. Uh, you know, that they're meant to reflect uh, market pricing. So what this means overall is that that will stimulate the economy. Initially, there'll be, you know, higher prices, but over time, that will mean that we can, you know, power the economy and then get things moving. So that way I see that if this works, we can start looking at double digit economic growth. And if that is sustained over time, every single sector will benefit in the long run. Thanks, I totally agree, Taiwo. And uh, just to kind of give up to uh, David, uh, David, uh, just looking at your experience so far, obviously, in energy transition, um, how would you, you know, rate the impact of the PIA uh, for Nigeria's energy future 
considering the fact that we want to be also relevant and uh, you know, be up to date with what is happening globally. Thank you for that, and thanks for having me. It's so great to be with such impressive uh, other guests. Yeah, I think the the PIA, as one of the, the other speakers mentioned, is a bit late in terms of the kind of uh, overarching uh, dynamics that are going on in the world, primarily around the global climate change perspective. Ha however, I think that we're kind of witnessing transitory pricing, and so we're going to continue to see high oil and gas pricing around hydrocarbons. And we're going to continue to see pressure on decarbonization and that we're going to see oil uh, dependency go up and, and not down on a, in a global perspective. Having said that, then one of the kind of PIA fundamentals is looking to how to provide more stability inside the country. And I think this provides a lot of challenges to that. So one is I really commend the government's vision and there are a long list of successful visions that have some have been enacted, but few of them have been enacted as well as the government had hoped. And so what I could say from here is I, I think it's critical that these are executed as precisely as they've been kind of laid out. And again, I'm you know, just getting up to speed on that. I, I would say that one of the fundamental challenges is that uh, attracting foreign direct investment into oil and gas projects is gonna remain to be difficult. So increased level of certainty is critical to being able to bring that capital in. And with Nigeria being one of the most populous countries in the world and continuing to grow with the high oil and gas dependency, then we're gonna see a high oil and gas pricing and that's gonna be on the shoulders of people in Nigeria and with many of them unelectrified. So my suggestion is, you know, the kind of perspective is that uh, we need more financing of more resilient energy resources Hydrocarbons are certainly one of them, and Nigeria needs to produce oil when there is still demand, which is today. But the high transitory pricing that we're seeing is here to also stay, and it's going to be borne by those that have the least amount of access to electricity today. Thanks for that. And just kind of staying on, you know, you know um, the issue of a transition fuel. Like, um, you know, I like what you said about, um, you know. Petroleum and oil in, in the short term might definitely still be very relevant. But considering mm -hmm. what the government is now doing with regards to the um, decade of gas initiative, you know, how would you appraise uh, the country's efforts so far? And um, you know, what would be your thoughts around how we can actually make uh, the decade of gas more impactful? Yeah, I mean, I think exactly your point that it is probably a decade of gas as part of a transition or maybe 15 years. It's not a uh, forever position. So I think infrastructure is the most critical piece as we're facing kind of these climate impacts. I would say that the pricing impacts are a direct result of climate uh, vulnerability. So as we're starting to see weather and climate patterns shifting, seeing those prices move. So it's not just a supply and demand question. So I think infrastructure is hypercritical for kind of stability in the country. And as one of the other speakers was mentioning, it's really about the productive use of that electricity or those the energy in a more broad sense. So getting the infrastructure together and dramatically increasing the role of renewables inside the energy mix plus uh, more transmission is going to be critical we're seeing in certain places like where I live in California, we're moving to rapidly to low carbon and high energy uh, demand from renewables. But we're also seeing a lot more stability in our grid because of it in very certain specific ways because we have those uh, hydrocarbon resources to balance. So it's not one or the other, it's all of them. And we must do it all very, very quickly and much faster than we've ever done before or the consequence will be borne by those with the, the least amount of resource. Thanks. And I think just to also then uh, bring um, Mr. Kinyomi, you know, into the, into the mix, um, looking at it from the lenses of, uh, of a, a Nigerian company that is driving um, engagement in the industry. You know, the first question would be, um, how do you suggest that upstream companies transit smoothly from the existing host community agreements and structures, that's the DMOUs to the 
post community trust fund that's related in the PIA. So if you look at your current agreement with your host community, how do you see the transition in happening? Uh, thank you, Chijuke. Uh, correction, it's Hamilton. I'm I'm standing in for Mr. Sir, I, I do apologize. <laughs> I actually got it right the first time. That's apologize. okay. That's okay. Um, from from Lekol's perspective, uh, and thank you for the question, by the way. From Lekol's perspective, the the PIA uh, uh, aspects on the host community uh, and the, and the host community development fund trust fund. Uh, we find to be aligned with the process we already have in place. And, you know, it, 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 in fact, it closely mirrors what, what we have. When we, uh, when our joint venture with Green Energy um, uh, commenced uh, work on the autarkical marginal field, our current producing asset, um, we set up a GMOU. And uh, in parallel, set up as part of that GMO, you set up a, a, a trust fund, a, a development trust fund uh, for that community. That trust fund governs all the projects and all the activities that uh, the joint venture would fund for the communities. Uh, the difference uh, now is this PIA specifies uh, the amount of money that goes into that trust fund, which is 3% of the previous year's CapEx. It's a little high, but, but it's also reasonable. And uh, for companies uh, in uh, host community relationships, you know, there needs to be some introspection. Um, and you know, there's a good, there's a good uh, 12 months uh, time frame uh, in order to transition uh, into compliance. And I think it shouldn't be a difficult thing for, for other companies to transition. We at LECRA, we're already in good position because we're already aligned with with uh, the provisions of uh, of the Act uh, regarding host communities. Now, one of the things that we welcome also, and this is sort of addressing the overall the overarching theme of this uh, of this panel discussion, is welcoming the PIA uh, in today's in today's age. Yes, it's late, but uh, we have an opportunity to address real issues. Uh, one of the real issues is energy poverty. And we see that in our host communities uh, where, you know, uh, the cost of energy to cook is, you know, is, is pretty expensive or access to that energy is pretty expensive. So they resort to using things like wood. And we know that wood burns uh, uh, 10 times worse than, than gas. So we have an initiative where we're currently transitioning um, uh, gas to power. So we're currently flaring, but we've brought in um, turbines, gas turbines, that would power, that would pass our gas through to provide, um, and generate and provide electricity uh, for the community first, and then for other users later on. Now, as time goes by, as, as we progress in time, in the age of uh, renewable energies, then we can see we can see that transition take other forms. But the reality is that as a country, we're sitting on about three, about a trillion cubic feet of gas, and that resource has to be uh, exploited uh, before uh, we can, you know, we can consider or we can look at or maybe clearly what, at the same time as considering renewable energy strategies in parallel. Thank you. Very, very, very well said, sir, very well said. And just to kind of pick up on what you've talked about in terms of um, the timing of the PIA, you know, I just wanted to now look at it from the perspective of the competitive landscape of the African oil and gas industry. And, um, you know, being a Pan-African oil and gas company yourself, how does the PIA impact the competitiveness of the Nigerian oil and gas industry? So do we see a situation where we will attract a bit more of the, um, of the investment dollars to Nigeria with the PIA? Um, again, that's a good question, Chidi. Okay. Uh, so the PIA, one of the things the PIA does first and foremost is it, it creates 
clarity. There's a lot more clarity now for investors. So investing in Nigeria, there's a playbook uh, for the investor as to what, you know, what the environment is going to be like, where, where the money is going. It's a lot clearer than it is today. Um, in terms of competitiveness, um, Nigeria, the PIA or the provisions of the PIA make Nigeria a lot more competitive market to be in, uh, at least more competitive than our neighbors uh, in the Gulf of Guinea uh, in terms of the tax rates. And I, we have tax experts here and they can speak to that. But I believe our tax rates are much lower uh, in the same region compared to, um, to our neighbors in, in the same Gulf. So uh, the combination of the tax rates, the provisions of the PIA, um, and, um, and, the, and, the, and the clarity um, makes, makes this more com competitive for, for Nigeria. You know what, uh, Mr. AC, I'm going to make this a uh, general question for the panel because I really would like to hear you know, the thoughts of the other members of the panel yes. on, on this as well to see has this really made us competitive. Because I was in a I was in a session with uh, one of the uh, consulates from the EU, and this was an issue that came up. With, that are we now a bit more competitive? So I'm going to throw it to I'm going to throw it to Taiwo to say Taiwo, what are your thoughts on this? And then I'm also going to talk to the other panelists about this. So what are your thoughts in terms of the competitiveness? And do you think that the PIA is going to make us a bit more competitive? And uh, how help us attract more of the investment dollars, considering the limited amount of invest investable, you know, funds out there. Yeah, so that that's a very good question, but also a very difficult one to answer. Um, on one hand, you know, we can start with the headline rate, and we say the rate is not too bad because if you take something like deep offshore, you only be paying thirty percent because you don't pay hydrocarbon tax. So to, to a very large extent, that rate looks competitive. If you look at the royalty rates, uh, royalty on production, you know, it's uh, cleaner than before, it's lower than before, but then you now have a royalty rate that is based on price. You know, maybe not something to worry about because if the price doesn't go up, then you don't have to pay it. If the price goes up, then it means you're fine. So essentially, uh, what then happened is we have to look beyond just the sub-region and then look into what else is happening elsewhere in the world because people who are investing in this region can as well invest you know anywhere and take their money there so it will be a combination of these fiscal provisions but even more, more importantly the regulatory environment and the uncertainties and uh, maybe we begin to address it uh you know progressively so I'll say it looks like is at least I can say authoritatively that it looks better than the old regime, and that will confirm when we see people converting voluntarily within 18 months. If nobody is converting, then it means that it's not even as good as what we had before. Uh, but I think the jury is still out there. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't know if either David or Tengi have any comments on that before I move on. To this is David. I, I think that one of the biggest challenges right now is that any investment in the oil and gas sector globally is going to be challenged by the narrative of climate change. So although I like applaud the clarity, I think it's going to be challenging to find large scale investment because we're finding the large investors are shying away from oil and gas sector and it, investments in their entirety, despite some of the good benefits that they provide to the stability of the region both their investors, their board members. Now it's becoming much, much more challenging, uh, which I think from an energy stability perspective and for the good of the country is, is not great because despite all of these good um, measures that are gonna attract financing, finding it is gonna be extremely challenging in the future. So I think if, if these are enacted quickly and they demonstrate success, there will be capital available but we're already seeing, you know, the, the large majors around the world, uh, plus the governments, uh, the U.S. being one of the leaders in that, really saying out loud they can't support hydrocarbon infrastructure development. And with maybe this transitionary period, it'll help where we see higher pricing. But I'm overall concerned that there will be available capital that's at affordable rates. Thank you. Um, just to, yeah, just to jump on on that as well. I mean, in terms of the long term prospects, obviously, 
does that suddenly challenging? The energy mix needs to be broadened, especially for Nigeria, in terms of incorporating new renewables and things like that in the longer term. Um, but like I said, in the short term, there are more opportunities, um, obviously. So clarity has been mentioned as well in terms of the act. So there are different things around the gas um, infrastructure as well that's opened up, open access, things like that. Um, lower gas to power um, pricing as well. Those sort of things are potentially actually in the short term, which is why you say the decade of gas is very important for Nigeria and critical in terms of attracting revenue for those things as well. And seeing, I think for Nigeria, the, the key thing is to make sure that as we're planning, as we're trying to get the revenue for all of this and try to get investments in the shorter term, that we're planning um, consciously for how to transition away and we potentially use those revenues that we get into sort of more renewable sort of base in the future. Um, but I think there's still an opportunity now to try to take advantage of um, that profile. The, the PIA does have those benefits. Um, but again, like I said, I think everyone else has said as well, it's a shorter term um, sort of opportunities um, and then planning for a sort of a future where um, when these investments are, are certainly dry, dried up, that we will not be um, sort of have stranded assets um, and then not be able to sort of benefit at that point because um, we won't have any off takers for um, our, our oil and gas. Well said. I think there's one thing you kind of touched on, which was clarity. And I think Dave also touched on that. And if we're talking about clarity, I guess my question to you, Tangi, then would be, you know, that the PIA is looking to just drive a bit more of accountability and transparency in the oil and gas industry, which is something that in previous time has just been a bit of ache with regards to how they've actually, you know, functioned and the ability to actually you know, um, interact with an industry that, you know, the rules of engagement are not as clear as they should be. So how do you see the PIA looking to achieve an objective of a bit more accountability and transparency? Um, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Um, PIA, um, I think, is, is trying to address that issue with the oil and gas sector that has been seen to be very opaque, um, very closed off, difficult to understand and engage with. Um, so the PIA is trying to provide that, I guess, readily available information um, in a way that is timely as well. And you see that in with, across the whole um, PIA um, in terms of how the upstream um, commission will work, the way the midstream and, and downstream will work. There are a lot of disclosure um, requirements across the board um, in terms of audited um, reports being put out, annual reports being put out consistently. Um, you have with the NNPC as well, similar disclosure requirements around um, audits, et cetera. Um, you'll find that, I mean, recently or not so long ago, you had the NNPC publish its audited accounts and there was a lot of hoopla around, you know, how commendable um, that was. But now you have it sort of enshrined in the law and it's supposed to be, it's a requirement. It's not sort of a, dis it's a discretionary um, sort of requirement that's, any administration within an NOC could um, decide to, to, to um, adopt. So that's something that's there as well. And you have um, model model contracts sort of terms as well put in. So as, as much as clarity as possible as well, um, in terms of making sure that in terms of the licenses, the leases, the production sharing contract, public sharing contract, et cetera, the terms also are included there. So there's a lot more transparency um, around terms. Um, within the PIA, trying to address those concerns that have been raised um, in the past around contractual provisions, et cetera. Um, you would even see even within practice as well, um, you've had an NPC try and take on some of these on board until publishing its, its reports um, and incorporation of the of NATI, um as well in terms of its its structure and its and its working its working. So it's a, it's very optimistic in terms of um, trans transparency. It would then still be left to um, the public, civil society. Uh, in general, to make sure that those those reports and documents that come out are interrogated um, and engaged in the right questions, if needed, are also asked. Um, so there's the PIA is doing its part in terms of transparency. Um, the public also has a role to play in terms of making sure that they um, are held accountable. Well said. And just thinking about some of the things you said, I think one of the key issues will be implementation. So I guess my question to Taiwo at its first, and then obviously. The rest of the panelists would be, you know, the achievement of the objectives of PIA, I think, would be centered on implementation. So, you know, how do we see this implementation happen and what kind of challenges do we foresee with the implementation of the PIA? 
I'm going to start with Taiwo and then kind of run through all the panelists on this. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I think this is probably the most important thing we need to watch out for. So the reason why Nigeria has not attracted investments over the past 10, 20 years uh, was because majorly uh, due to the uncertainty. So I'll say that legislative uncertainty about, you know, the, the legal framework. So now to a large extent that has been addressed. So I say to a large extent because I wasn't expecting that there would be an amendment being proposed almost immediately. And I thought that could have waited. Because once you then go to the National Assembly to say, can you also help us with this and that, everybody brings everybody everything back and then want to amend. And that creates uncertainty again for the investors. The second issue is, so you do also want to replace this with uh, what I call regulatory and administrative uncertainty. So if you issue regulations and they create more confusion than they are removing, uh, all administrative processes are just cumbersome and uncertain with a lot of discretion, it will create an issue as well. That's a potential pitfall or not involving stakeholders uh, enough. So you shouldn't develop any of these regulations thinking that you know what the answers are without speaking to all the other stakeholders, including domestic and potential foreign investors uh, and not to delay in issuing those regulations and issuing those guidelines. And maybe the last thing I will mention is around capabilities and capacity for the institutions within the PIA. So um, I wasn't very excited when I heard the politician, you know, <laughs> appointed into one of these. I, I wish that we could just, you know, get professionals and technocrats, people who have run organizations profitably, you know, to, but unfortunately it's a mixed bag. But, we still hope for the best. At the end of the day, whether we're going to be competitive is not just about the headline rate. It will be the risk adjusted returns. People will be looking at all of these risks, given, you know, bearing in mind that we have our own country specific risk and they're still there. Insecure, insecurity is one of it. So overall, uh, we need to avoid these pitfalls. Well said, Taiwo. So I'd like to get the perspective of an operator. So uh, Mr. Isi, what are your thoughts around it? Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll address this from two perspectives, one, the regulatory and then two, uh, conversion. Um, on the regulatory side, the, the creation of the two eight regulatory agencies is, is, um, is a great, um, uh, piece of change in the sense that there's more bandwidth uh and focus uh for better performance it's yet to be tested but there's the promise of that there so it's 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 very welcome um on the conversions there are incentives uh for converters um for example um our producing asset is a is a, is a marginal field or tactical marginal field uh the incentive for us to convert you know is almost automatic the low tax rates Drop from 85% to 60 to 62, I think. Uh, however, the ro royalty rate has increased for, uh, for producers under 10,000 barrels a day. But at 10,000 barrels a day and, and above, then it's pretty much a wash. So the incentives are clear. And, um, you know, really, it's just a matter of time uh, uh, for every, every operator to consider their portfolio, uh, the impact on the PIA uh, provisions uh, on their assets, and then make that decision on whether and when uh, to convert. That's well said. And then David, you know, if you're looking at it from an outside in perspective where you know, an international investor and someone who is keenly looking at the oil and gas industry, what would be your thoughts around the implementation? based on the experience in other parts of the world as well. So I think my concern about the implementation is more about the t timing. So I, I think that this makes lots of sense in uh, of itself, but it can only work in an ecosystem that is really pushing for decarbonization and the, that hydrocarbons have a, a long lasting and significant role in that. But if we look at it in isolation where the PIA and oil and gas sector on its own doesn't isn't coupled with 
stronger energy matrix, more around uh, electrification of all productive use. If we lose sight of those other pieces, I think then we will lose that it will be very difficult to uh, grow at the speed that the infrastructure needs to because the narratives have shifted so dramatically. And it's difficult, I think, to do any one of these things in a vacuum, recognizing that the global narrative sentiment. I mean, maybe one of the points I'd really like to make is that in the US, it's no longer a political question. This is a public sentiment question. So the oil and gas sector in the US are dramatically looking to decarbonize. And you can see it by the, they're changing their names, they're at saying that they're carbon companies, they're changing the, the composition of their boards, they're changing the composition of the, the actual kits. This is no longer political, it is public sentiment and it changed five years ago. So I think we're, my, my kind of point would be that the biggest challenge to the implementation of this is it has to be a yes and government component. And this by itself is unlikely to be successful, in my opinion, for a stable Nigeria without more clarity and investment strategies in other energy sectors. Well said. And then, uh, Tengi, do you have any thoughts around that? Uh, I mean, similar to what um, the other panelists have said, I think what will be key, as we've said, there are some good components of the PIA. Um, it's making sure that we have it implemented in the spirit with which it was intended. Um, we've already addressed that obviously there were not enough considerations around um, transition and what that would look like within that. But I think having a sort of a plan, um, a renewable policy or transition or general energy policy really for Nigeria, um, because our energy security is very pivotal. Um, given what's going on um, in the globe. So we need to sort of have something holistically planned. Um, and as we're working towards decade of gas and all these other um, imperatives that we're taking it um, sort of as a whole for Nigeria to be able to um, position itself uh, to be able to benefit in the short term from its um, oil and gas resources, but also ensuring that it is placing itself to be ready to transition um, thereafter. Well, maybe kind of picking up on that, Tengi, that the question really is, you know, the, the future of energy you know, and, you know, where we are now as a country compared to, you know, where the world is moving to. So if the PIA is not able to achieve that, then what? What do we then need to do? Because based off of the, your earlier comments on the PIA, it seems to suggest that this is a, a piece of legislation that may not necessarily address the future of energy. So then what would then be the suggestion on is it an update to the PIA? Or are we looking at something different? You would then want to compare us to where we want to aspire to be. Yeah, um, I think there are so many different components um, to this. So again, not looking at the um, PIA in isolation or the oil um, and gas sector in isolation, looking at it comparatively and preparing for a future. Um, as I said initially, we Nigeria is dependent on, on oil, for instance, um, for its export and foreign exchange earnings. Um, so looking at now even, how do you diversify um, away from that now? How do you start to make that make those plans? Um, because we rely on that for debt servicing, um, rely on, on oil again for um, about 50% of Nigeria's um, government revenue. How do we start to make those plans to diversify away from that? So not just in energy, um, also for the economy, for the larger economy. So it's a holistic sort of conversation um, that we have to start to look at and try to displace those dependencies um, as well, because it's so critical. Um, and I think I think it's actually pivotal that is happening now. So we're not at the last, we're say 15 years down the line and everything is dried up. We still have some opportunities. It's critical that we focus on that implementation. We ramp up our efforts quickly. Um, look at the other sectors that we've looked at initially. Was that diversification has, has come up for Nigeria at different points, um, but there's always that diverging sort of view that comes in when all prices are low and then we're ramping up our diversification efforts and conversation and then we shift again when it seems that all prices have 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 gone up a bit um it's not the same as it was before uh, because the narrative um has completely changed and there is a future that's inevitable and looming and so those steps have to be critical we're not going to go back 
um, to say a 20 year um, sort of prior. So it's being very, very deliberate um, and taking those steps. And, I, and it's quite concerning because we've seen um, Nigeria very committed to um, certain certain moves and policy initiatives and then a rollback. So it's, it's concerning in that regard. I hope the momentum is kept, um, but also in terms of um, our energy security, as I've said, um, making sure that we find other places um, and other sources for dollars um, as well. Those sorts of thinking um, holistically, I think is very important, um, as well as expanding our energy mix. And there needs to be a lot more conversation and cohesion um, in terms of the plans um, towards climate change and energy transition, safe and more of environment, um, towards the power um, or the energy um, components of our economy. So, oil and gas. There's just this needs to be this holistic um, sort of conversation and planning and consistent um, sort of refining as well, because we're in a very critical juncture, um, and where Nigeria will be the next. Um, in the next 20 years will really depend on what we do at this very critical um, stage that we're in. So if I were to hold you to this uh, day specifically, what kind of policy are you looking at? You're now the minister, minister in charge of energy. Um, I said it like an, an energy <laughs> policy. As, sorry, Dave can help out as well. Because I saw him nodding. Yeah, no, certainly, certainly, and they should. Um, yeah, but again, I, I've sort of alluded to it. Maybe I need to be more specific. Um, okay, I want an energy policy, like an, a holistic one, um, looking at the gaps that you have within the PIA and what it takes to transition, um, to expand our energy mix, um, having that sort of conversation as well, additionally. Again, not necessarily looking at the PIA being amended, um, but having sort of a supplementary, again, it's an energy conversation. It's not just an oil and gas conversation. And it's an overhaul of the economy, really. It's like when I see the 2022 um, a budget coming around, I want to see representation of that in terms of moving moving it towards in that direction, you know, and then holistically plan and implementation um, across the government sectors and working with private sector as well. It's it's going to take everyone um, to move this forward, and that's what I would do it as the minister. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, I mean, Dave or Taiwo, or does anybody have any other thoughts around? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. I, I think one of the one of the challenges in this whole conversation is the narrative that the transition implies that there is an old way of doing things and then a new way of doing things. And we're in the midst of that like handoff where I think it's more complex than that. And the oil and gas sector broadly has to show the leadership to transition into this new world and be a part of it. So it's not the tapering down of oil and gas reserves and the tapering off of renewables. It's more fundamental in the way the oil and gas sector functions. So I see that like as trying to like uh, with renewable energy being the cheapest form of electricity in the world today. And I think that's relatively well understood outside of cooking. I, I think that you know, there may be some debate there, but the oil and gas sector can, to, can support those roles to make more money by exporting gas uh, to so that Nigerians aren't paying this transitional premium. But even more fundamentally is like, I think the, a green hydrogen economy is coming and we're seeing bit, bits and pieces of it here. And there's no one better position than the oil and gas sector to participate in that, both through our kind of existing gas infrastructure, as well as the expertise, the education, the engineering, all of that resources exist. And the final piece like for me is that the Nigeria leans hard on that the, the natural resources in the country are oil and gas, which there are, but there are many others. It's sunny, it's windy, it's connected in a very unique geography that allows it to be a central pillar of the West Africa power pool. And through that, both with pipelines and hydrocarbons, Nigeria really could become the leader across the region of a green energy economy that was fundamentally supported or kind of born from the oil and gas sector. So, you know, without like, I think there are lots of implementation of those policies, and this is a great example of it needs to be enacted quickly and swiftly and work and the clarity and, you know, without kind of backing up and then doubling down on that, because I think Nigeria has a real role of leadership across the whole region. Well said. Uh, Mr. Isi, uh, Taiwo, does any of, do any of you have uh, any comments on the policy for the future of energy? Uh, yeah, um, this is just a thought. I'm I'm not sure that because we're talking about the Petroleum Industry Act or bill which became an act, um, and then we're talking about 
um, renewable energy and you know, a, kind of a revised energy policy. I, I, I think those are two separate things. Um, if I were to, you know, to align with uh, Tengi, I would say, I would go beyond uh, Tengi's comments by saying we would need an overarching energy policy. That incorporates the PIA and, you know, everything else in terms of energy mixes, you know, other energy, energy sources. But I also think that, um, also acknowledging uh, David, um, I also think that the markets uh, will dictate uh, the pace of uh, that transition. It's already started. Um, as, he's, as he's well noted, um, raising money now is, is difficult if you don't have um, a renewable energy uh, a, a narrative in your story. So these are things that I think, uh, that, that's my view, anyway. Well said. Mm -hmm. I will. Yeah, so I think maybe just a, a few comments to add. I do agree with all the comments by the other speakers. Uh, maybe it would be a question of, uh, in reality, so we talk about decarbonization, renewable energy, but even the projections for the next 10, 15 years, is that in terms, in terms of the energy mix, we are still gonna have fossil fuel being the number one contributor to that. But of course, with um, a declining relevance over time. So what would be a good strategy for Nigeria in my view, is a strategy that says, let us optimize fossil fuel, right? We know that we're not optimizing it. Uh, even diversification within that sector itself is lacking. Uh, there are more than a hundred derivatives, right? So as we diversify and optimize that sector, we use the money we make from it as a country and also in terms of policy to encourage investors to keep investing and start investing in renewables uh, and also to decarbonize. Nigeria is already committed to that and we need to be true to our commitments so that over time, Nigeria is in a vantage position, in my view, and if we don't do anything, someone else will come to the space. We have to be the hub, at least for Africa. We can also leverage the African continental free trade area to make this happen, so that all the investment and the research and all the stuff that you need to do around this, you know, energy transition should be anchored out of Nigeria. So it is not one or the other. They can go hand in hand, and one of the things we recommended at PwC is you know, instead of just having only a frontier exploration fund to find more fossil fuel, can we also have an official energy fund where we start thinking about this kind of investment, both from the public sector side, as well as using policy to drive it from the private sector uh, perspective. Well said, well said, Taiwo. Um, we're running out of time on this session, but I just, I, I know it will be remiss of me if I don't also go back to the PIA and ask questions around how it's going to drive participation by indigenous companies and also just uh, kind of also talk about the impact from a local content standpoint. Given the fact that it seems to seems that the PIA is also going to start encouraging more serious players to come into the industry. So I would like to hear Stacey's thoughts on that impact of the PIA on local participation by indigenous companies? Um, oh, that's, that's, um, that's, that's kind of a given. Um, I, I, it's, it's going to increase, uh, it's going to increase enforcement, um, uh, and compliance, um, simply said. Um, when we look at the, um, uh, the, the local content, uh, act and, and its provisions, uh, the PIA just simply aligns, aligns with that. And I think there are more, uh, there are more opportunities, uh, for, uh, local participation, um, which ties into, uh, into the provisions that the host community development fund, uh, uh enables as well. So we're going to see a lot of um, uh, a lot of increase 
um, might, might I be bold enough to, to say that uh, we'll see a lot more uh, creation of wealth uh, in communities uh, that, that, that will now get more access to opportunities uh, under the Local Content Act. Um, so, uh, we're literally out of time, uh, so maybe if we could take a few final comments from the um, panelists before we then move to the next sec section, which would be Q&A. So, uh, I'm going to start in no particular order, Dave. Thank you. Well, thanks for this. It's super interesting and such a timely this discussion. I mean, I think that was the piece I've really taken by listening to the other panelists of like how deliberate and complex these issues are, but how necessary this dialogue will be and how important it is that we get it right. So I think the kind of my parting thoughts are is that, you know, the transition is more of a, a running handoff and not the end of one era and the beginning of another, but that if we don't collaborate and recognize that hydrocarbons have a role in that, then we will will really be the, uh, um, we won't be able to have the resilience that are necessary for a successful future. Um, Mr. AC? Uh, parting thoughts? Yes, please. Yes. Um, I, I think this was a pretty good uh, discussion. Um, um, we have an opportunity um, as a country to maximize the opportunities we have, uh, the resources that we have in terms of oil and gas. I liked uh, what was said earlier on um, uh, by, uh, by um, I can't remember his name. Mr. Yedele or Dave? Yes, yes, about uh, uh, the policy of uh, uh, optimizing our existing, existing uh, resources. Um, optimizing oil and gas. We're sitting on trillions of cubic feet of, of gas, and, uh, and we're nowhere near tapping um, uh, a decent measure of that. And there's, there are power problems uh, in Nigeria to solve, and, and there's more than enough to export to other uh, locations that uh, need gas for power. Uh, but uh, regardless, the PIA creates an opportunity that makes Nigeria more competitive. It also uh, reduces uh, uh, tax obligations for operators like, like us at Lake Oil. And I think uh, looking forward uh, into the landscape of investments uh, or attracting foreign investments, then you know, we also have an opportunity to uh, redefine ourselves uh, in, in light of the renewable, uh, uh, re renewable energy movement uh, in order to increase or uh, re-attract uh, Foreign investments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Taiwo? Yeah, thank you very much. I think just to build on that, I also find this section very uh, useful. So thanks to the American Business Council. Uh, I'll say my, my parting shot will be that we can always remind ourselves that the PIA is not a perfect piece of legislation. I don't think it was intended to be. Uh, but it is it is progressive. So in other words, it's better than where we used to be, even though it's not perfect. Uh, I'll therefore then want to invite and call on all stakeholders, um, the existing investors, uh, you know, potential investors, foreign and local, you know, analysts and experts like us, and as well as you know, host communities, for example, and the ordinary Nigerian as well as policymakers to look at this as something that is going to help us uh, develop our economies and to also bring prosperity to our people so in our own little way we should try and you know be very objective in our analysis uh, so there are some concerns around even the host community three percent versus thirty percent and some people are using that narrative uh, to heat up the system and if you don't manage that well um, 
some guys may just start blowing up everything again, right? And then, you know, we get into another crisis. So overall, we need to have um, a collaborative approach. I'll call it collaborative approach, but also has to be coordinated in how we implement. And as we go along, when we find things that are not perfect and they're not working, let's put them on the table. And with sincerity of purpose, let's look for what to do about them. And then we continue to, to march forward. Said, and then uh, Tengi, uh, Tengi, your final thought? Yeah, um, uh, I said thank you um, for having me um, here as well. I'm happy to contribute to this conversation. Um, my parting shot then will be that it is the PIA, yes, was a little late um, for Nigeria, but it still has a lot of positives um, to bring to the sector and to benefit Nigeria's efforts um, towards optimizing its um, its resources, its revenues um, from its oil and gas resources. Um, but that's still um, within that, it is fair to, for Nigeria to still make sure that um, the implementation um, is gotten right and we don't take as, as long as we did in passing the bill to implement. Um, we're already seeing sort of signs of that implementation. So I think making sure that we get it, get it done right um, and quickly and also engage with the larger sector, the private sector specifically as well, to make sure that we get as much as we can do um, within the time that we have to do so. Well said, uh, Tengi. And thank you very much to all the panelists. I think this has been an extremely conversation and the conversation will continue that's that's for sure and um, I think you know one of the things that we've talked about is how the, the PIA and obviously you know the PIA it's not perfect um, it's evolving and I think the first step which is a step in the right direction was passing this piece of legislation and which will start implementing more certainty um, we're going to open uh, this up for questions from our participants. Uh, please feel free to type your question in the chat box and uh, we'll be able to pick it up. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for this Q&A session. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we'll pick that up. I think one or two questions have come through. There was a comment on advocacy for solar and biogas by um, Dr. Anna Potter. So I guess it's more of a comment to say you know, how well are we looking at from a renewable standpoint and how do we advocate for that. Um, I'll see if there's any other question that's come through. Um, wow, this looks a bit complex and it's directed to all the panelists. It says Africa, Africa emits low CO2 to the atmosphere. With the COP26 coming up in the UK in November, can African governments lobby for leeway on investment in gas? It says this is for all the panelists to answer. I'm not very familiar I with COP26, but yeah, go ahead. Anybody yeah, I can start. Answer? I can start. So, of course, uh, you know, I'll say maybe we can call it a class action, not to invest in fossil fuel. But already this, this request has been made about developing countries because we're not starting from the same point. So it's like trying to run a race and some guys are already two kilometers ahead of you. So it's difficult to catch up, right? So the idea is that for developing countries, can you give us some you know, leeway? So even the likes of, of the World Bank I have a caveat. We are not investing in fossil fuel except, and then you know that's where the likes of uh, many African countries will come into play. But that's not a guarantee that anything will happen because you know, like it was, I think it was Dave that made the point about there's also the public sentiment. So even when the investors are willing to invest, they are mindful about what the public will say and what the public will think about their investment. So it's not for us to go to sleep and say we have a leeway or waiver. Uh, we have to be thinking about investing in like i said optimize what you have and then think about the, the future of energy well said well said Taiwo. um so unfortunately you still have to talk a bit more because the next question is directed at you um this is a question from someone from shell 
They said, could you elaborate on the opportunities and risks in the midstream and downstream sector? Yeah. Yeah, so there are, <clears throat> there are a lot more opportunities across the entire value chain, uh, midstream, downstream, upstream. I think one good thing with the PIA is, uh, for once, we have a framework that interconnects the different points, right? So it's not looking at any stream in isolation. So it's linking them together. What role does, you know, gas play in, in energy? Uh, how do you link that with the upstream sector? and natural gas production, you know, and all of that. So, and even the pricing, right? Pricing of gas, for example, how does that link to refining and then the downstream? So overall, what this means is if you open up the investment um, space for all the streams, anyone who wants to invest will find something in need for themselves that they can do. And like we said, this even goes beyond the oil and gas sector to other sectors as well. So I'll say, if, if we start refining in Nigeria, for example, just imagine that we start refining enough to meet our demands and then to export. So, and then we have the other derivatives, um, maybe midstream, right? Petrochemicals and the rest of it. That's a huge opportunity, not only for the midstream and the downstream sector to get it to the customers, but also for, you know, the entire, you know, indirect support system of everyone that will be involved, including the final consumers. So it's, it's uh, I'll say it's very significant opportunities. Thanks, Tyro. Um, next question is directed at actually David Tengi and uh, Mr. Essi. And it says the EU lawmakers voted to prolong fossil fuel gas subsidy until 2027. I suspect this is due to the current situation in the energy space. Will this give an opportunity for more gas investments of which we've from fossil fuel? I, this is David. I mean, I think the answer is yes. I mean, we'll see more investment in natural gas infrastructure. I think we'll also continue to see pricing volatility. And partly because of the actual, precisely the impacts of climate change, that it is colder, longer, Hydro dams in Eastern Europe are not are freezing over sooner. There's a less reliance on renewables. And so I think we'll continue to see high pricing, which might kind of intersect with some of these other conversations of high pricing tends to lead to political instability. And so now that we're seeing rapid surge in Europe, that will be felt everywhere. And countries like Nigeria will the individuals in Nigeria will be the one that front there take a brunt of the impact. So that as we see surging pricing, individuals will be the ones paying for it uh, because exports will be so valuable. There, It is challenging to look at gas specifically because it is a fungible global product. So, I, yeah, I think the answer is yes, there will be more investment in the natural gas sector as long as it tells part of the story about being a contributor to a low carbon decarbonized society. And there will be no investment in high intense carbon uh, energy production like coal, for instance. Um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Essi or Tengi have any comments before we move to the next question. No, I, 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 I agree with Dave uh, completely. I think, though, that um, we, we, in the, the local, I, I disagree uh, on, on, on the local aspect of it in terms of local consumption as we continue to develop uh, gas in Nigeria. Um, a lot of the gas uh, development should be targeted at local consumption because of the great need here. Uh, so the, the, even though it is uh, a, fung a fungible product, um, uh, the global pricing um, well, I say I'll say the jury's still out on 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 the impact of of global pricing on local consumption at that point. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is directed at Tengi. Does the PIA offer incentives for decarbonization? Thank you, are you there? 
checking for the, um, the question. Oh, yes. I said, does the PIA Hello? offer? Okay. Thank you. Just let me know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I can hear you, yes. I can hear you now. Okay. Does the PIA offer incentives for decarbonization? Um, it, it does. It doesn't as yet. I think that was one of the one of the issues that we had um, with the with the initial sort of structure was to incorporate things around um, decarbonization or in transition. But we don't we don't have that quite yet. So I think that could be another sort of thinking um, with any supplementary uh, sort of bills or, or ideas that are, that are put put to the fore. It's it's certainly just just a general. Um, Sort of moving and consideration of any transition, but um, in terms of decarbonization, that's not within the bill as far as I know. Okay. I have any thoughts on that? Yes, I do agree. Uh, maybe what to add is to say that, in a way, um, the PIA has more provisions now that I would say uh, is increasing your costs if you don't decarbonize, even though the, the whole intention wasn't clearly stated as being incentivizing decarbonization, but then you're having a lot more provisions about the environment, about uh, things to do with the commissioning and abandonment fund, you know, and then just doing more, you know, impact assessment for your investments and so on and so forth. So what that means is, of course, the, the gas flaring one is also there. So which means it's now commercial, right? It's a commercial decision for you to actually decide to decarbonize to avoid those, those costs. So that, in a way, will be an indirect incentive. But I do agree. Maybe a subsequent amendment in some, you know, future years. I'm not proposing that now. Uh, we can then look at something more deliberate, you know, towards that. Okay. Um, maybe this question to uh, uh, Mr. Essi. Um, you know, when it comes to the provision around the abandonment, I think it's kind of picking up from Taiwan. When it comes to the provisions around abandonment, so some people have said that this is an incentive for investors having to set significant funds aside. But there's also another school of thought that says it would also prevent um, some sharp practices in the industry so around people who just decide to take up at night. You know, what are your thoughts, you know, looking at it from the perspective of an operator around the requirement to move? to actually fund an abandonment uh, program. Okay, uh, Chijoke, if you don't mind, can you repeat the question? I just had a bit of a problem. Uh, you, were, you were coming in. Just, now. just, just let so me know if you can hear me. Now. Yeah, I can hear you now. You can it hear me, coming. okay. Okay. I can hear yeah, you now. so the yeah. question is around the uh, abandonment fund. Okay. So if you're looking to set money aside, uh, you know, on a yearly basis to fund uh, abandonment, right? You know, from an investor's perspective, it's it's money that it's that they are having to put aside to fund a future, um, you know, instant. And considering the fact that some of these things are looking at me, I mean, twenty years, fifteen years from now, um. There's also another school of thought that says, well, we need to do that because some of these, you know, smaller companies who are not as compliant as they should be, just pack their suitcases up and leave at night. So what are your thoughts around this whole issue of setting up an abandonment fund and all the other things around the environment? Okay, I think um I think it's a responsible the, the process of abandonment uh, uh, should be conducted responsibly. Any responsible uh, uh, operator uh, should have uh, abandonment as part of his strategy, and most companies do. Um, the fact that it's it, it's a it's a requirement uh, is simply a a tool or a vehicle for policing that act in the event that there are irresponsible operators out there. Um, I, I think it makes sense. Uh, 
and it forces the issue on on responsibility uh, and that that would be uh my view on the face of it uh, in terms of the other school of thought you know i would have to leave it to you know to the to the various operators to do uh introspection and and decide for themselves you know how they want to behave but as far as i know um the abandonment process is a, is a responsible act uh to be performed by any company worth its salt maybe if i can throw this a bit open into the panelists okay. the panelists as well to say you know if i were to then argue that is that the best way to secure the abandonment process having someone actually set from the site or are there any other options that you can consider because speaking as an investor you know why would i have to have that kind of um a restriction on my on, on my ability to use my investable funds so i'm just throwing this open if any other person wants to chime in here if there are any other options we think this is the best way to handle um Sure, okay. that this compliance happened. Yeah, I mean, it's Dave again. I, I think that there are lots of instances of this around the world. Like nuclear in the U.S. is probably the most close analogy, where there are government-backed uh, funds in place for the decommissioning of nuclear plants far into the future. Because without those, then they wouldn't be viable. It's just another form of direct subsidy from the government, and so. I think in this case, like we have uh, similar issues with renewable energy in the US on decommissioned bonding measures. So there are, are purity products that exist that allow for kind of long term dismantling of equipment. And there's a long term useful life of these fields. I think that's the, one of the other pieces is what does abandonment mean? And then maybe in an enhanced oil recovery world, these fields last a lot longer than we clearly expected. So trapping cash from investors that maybe something will happen 20 years from now is so inefficient that there are probably better mechanisms that encourage investors and could be included in kind of subsequent bills around another form of government incentive to, to tackle that issue, um, particularly as you know carbon sequestration and things become more viable, making sure the carbon stays in the ground in perpetuity will be yet another one of these complex issues of like what happens if it leaks you know, a thousand years from now. Yeah, so I, I do I do agree. Actually, I think maybe coming from the past, right? So maybe the experience has just been horrible in Nigeria. That government just went to the other extreme. You know what? Just set the money aside. I don't even trust you to keep the money. Let it be with someone else. So if you don't do it, we just take the money and take care of the environment. So, in a way, you know, even though it's the right thing, and I do agree uh, that you know, any responsible investor should actually do that on their own without being asked to do it. But unfortunately, not all investors are responsible. So maybe from this very extreme end of setting the money aside, we need to move progressively to a point where either you give a guarantee, right? Um, so I, I know that my exposure is a million dollars, and then I'll buy you know a bond from a financial institution to provide that guarantee or when i build the trust over time you allow me to actually put that money within my system so it's a reserve that i set aside so i still have the use of the money and when the need arises i can call on it to remediate so i, I would agree that this is extreme and it raises the cost of investment if i have to set out uh, money separately for someone else to manage rather than keeping the funds to myself, pending when I need the, the, the spend to, to happen. Okay, thank you, Taiwo. Um, so, I don't know if any other person wants to comment or... And I think the others that I've seen are more like uh, comments. Uh, the PIA has come very late after the unbundling of PHCN, the railways, routes, etc. Like the panelists said, USA is five years ahead of what's happening. What is it's five years ahead? What is going to happen very soon is going to spill over and benefit other sectors very soon. So, we'll copy what the oil and gas companies are going to do. Yes, I guess there's still focused on timing of the PIA and the um, spillover effect. Um, 
another comment, or I think it's a question that has come through is what does it what does a just transition look like for current business owners? And what metrics are used to make the proper assessment to identify assets for those to be decommissioned? I'm trying to understand the, the, the connectivity between proper assessment to identify assets or those to be decommissioned. What does a just transition look like for current business owners? Well, this question is not very clear, so um, I'm just going to. Um, and um, I don't think I've seen any other questions that have come. There's a comment here that talks about what models or case studies of similar geographical planes are incorporated in terms of best practices for infrastructure development. And I support generating local. Well, okay, I'm also going to leave that comment because it's also not very clear. But I think um, we pretty much, we're almost done with our time. I think we have just about less than five minutes left for the entire session. So um, if there are no more questions coming through, I will hand over to uh, Margaret, who will then take us forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chijoke. Um this has really been uh, an enlightening conversation. Um, you know, I agree that the PIA is not exactly um, very, um, I mean, it's a bit belated, yeah, but it remains a commendable milestone from the government um, of, of Nigeria. Uh, it is not a perfect legislation like Taiwo noted, but it also provides them the room for improvement and, you know, further conversation. Uh, the energy transition will, you know, be expensive for emerging economies and stakeholders in Africa and especially Nigeria. And, and so there is a strong need for the country to begin to position it, it, it itself for investments. And like David um, said, hopefully, fingers crossed, we're, we're going to be looking um, at uh, more investments into uh, the country. Um, again, as the country positions itself or hopefully should position itself as a hub, in the light of the EFCFTA, the, the government really needs to begin to, um, you know, really look at how to make um, the, 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 the environment, you know, the ecosystem conducive for um, these investments to agree to happen. I, I, I also align with uh, Tengi and uh, Hamil Hutin on the need to have an overarching energy uh, policy that will speak to those areas of you know gas and and you know um, the areas that were are not currently um, in, included in the in the, in the act and um, I, I see that in in being able to put that together there is a need to for stakeholders both pro, uh, public sector and private sector to collaborate to have you know a best fit um, policy or legislation that can make that um, happen. So, I mean, I really would like to thank our panelists and the uh, participants who have uh, stayed with us for over one hour to discuss this very critical issue. But I also would like to share that the council um, is looking forward to working um, on the margins of OTC next year, or what we'll call the investments forum, um, you know, talking about this and we're looking forward to working with partners and, you know, uh, to collaborate with different stakeholders. So, um, Again, on behalf of the, the council, I would like to thank everyone here and I would say we'll would see you at the next uh, economic update. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.